Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, I actually am really excited for our guest. It is someone that I have followed on social media. I respect her work, respect what she's trying to do. Um, I've wanted her on our show for a really long time. And so I'm really excited to have our guest today, Dr. Keneally. So thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure to be sharing this special day today. So Well, thank you. Before we begin on the topics I want to talk about, will you just tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, what you do, things like that? All right. So I'm a medical doctor and I uh, started practicing 37 years ago. I went to college in Texas and then went to UT, University of Texas School of Public Health. Then I went to medical school in Chicago, and then I came out to do my training at Harbor UCLA, uh, and I started practicing in 1986. And uh, I started out with weight loss because that was a good way to get patients, and it still is, actually. And I interestingly started out my practice with a registered dietitian because I'm like, okay, the number one thing in weight is like, what are you putting in your mouth, right? Right. Now, of course, now advancing into today, you know, lots of things can contribute to being overweight and obese. But anyway, so that embarked my career and I got into cancer prevention because I'm number three of six children. And when my mother was pregnant in the 50s, she started to bleed and said she went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, well, we have this medication that we can give you to prevent the loss of the baby and stop the bleeding. So fast forward 16 years later, my parents receive a letter saying, oh, well, that DES caused cancer in both male and female offspring, hormone problems, anatomical problems, infertility problems, et cetera. Oh, wow. So that, yeah. So at that time, I'm like, okay, I, I'm good at science. I'm going to, I want to be a doctor. And so I started out, obviously you have to go do and do the foundational stuff, but then my whole journey was how do I not get cancer? Because the other things, the infertility problems, I couldn't help really other than, you know, I mean, I had children, but it wasn't in the typical way you have children. And I developed scoliosis. I did, I had scoliosis from in utero because of, you know, in a critical time of development, whenever, wherever you are, it affects, you know, your body, right? And so, uh, and back then they didn't have scoliosis checks, but they didn't really have any good treatment a long time ago anyway, other than wearing a brace 24 seven. So anyway, so I learned everything natural about what you can do with musculoskeletal issues. And so my whole life is like how to find the where, where, when, and how of any problem, like go back and go down the rabbit hole. Um, you know, the conventional medical approach is, okay, it's reactive, all right? You get a problem, here's the drug, here's the surgery, or here's the drug and the surgery, okay? And so we need to, you know, all physicians and or other practitioners, they need to understand the origin of a disease, Mm. number one. Number two, you need to understand the patient with the disease, not the disease of the patient. Love that. And so, and create a partnership because when I see a patient, I under, I try to understand what happened from in utero to where they are now because mm-hmm. everything matters. Everything matters with the patient. And you need to go over every facet of their daily existence, okay? And why they are in where they are, you know, whether it's a brain tumor, whether it's autoimmune disease, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, it doesn't matter what the label is. My job is to unravel that label and de-diagnose you. Oh, I love that so much. Uh, Too bad that not all doctors have this philosophy and, you know, work through these methods, but that's a whole episode in itself. (laughs) Yeah. I, well, I agree with you because I feel so bad for all the people out there who are in the system and they don't want know how to get out of it. They can't find a doctor who can like get down to unraveling what's going on. And, you know, they're victims of the system. And yeah. the number one complaint I hear 
every single day, no matter where they're from, is that the doctors don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't listen. And then they tell them nothing natural works. Right. Yep. I've been there. Yeah. So how is that even possible when there's so many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of papers on PubMed, uh, the benefits of green tea, the benefits of vitamin C, the benefits of like, you know, everything. Right. Okay. And and what did doctors do a hundred years ago? There were no medicines. I've asked that question too. Yeah. So there a hundred years ago, there were no medicines. So so, um, you know, we, we have to use the biological nature to how to heal. All right. And so, um, so I'm trying to transform just like you are, we're all trying to transform the future of health care and humanity. And, and cause we're at a crossroads. Okay. In, 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 you know, there's no, we're at the point of no return for conventional medicine. It's great. If you break a harm, get in a car accident, fall off a ladder. It's phenomenal. Okay. Don't get me wrong. So in emergency care, there's probably nowhere better in the world to be is in an emergency room in the United States. But when it comes to chronic diseases, the top chronic disease is heart disease. Still, a lot of people, you know, think it's cancer, but, and they're neck and neck now, but heart disease is still number one. Cancer is number two. And exponentially growing. And third is the medical system, the properly prescribed use of medicine and errors. So some people say that's actually number one, uh, but because it's not all accounted for, if you know what I'm saying, if you go down, how many medicines were they on, et cetera, what did those medicines cause in the patient that caused the death, right? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so we, we've got to, you know, U.S. It ranks 43rd in the world in healthcare, Okay. We spend two and a half times more than any other country. We're not in the, even in the top five. Wow. So we, we know what we're doing is not working. We know that. Okay. Look at cancer. Nixon declared war on cancer in 1970. 2024, cancer is exponentially worse. Okay. The diagnosis and the care is worse. Okay. So we have to all say, we all have to look at this re in reality and take inventory of what's going on. Children, just one in 37 have autism. Elementary kids, 60% have one or more chronic problems. Teenagers have the highest rate of anxiety, depression, suicide, and 30-year-olds are getting cancer. So we all should be saying, this is really serious. This is a 911. But I feel like everybody's just like looking the other way. I'm trying to do my part, okay? But, and I know you're trying to do your part. And other health podcasts, and there are other doctors, because I was just on a think tank in, in Florida this weekend uh, of trying to create a curriculum for integrative oncology to teach young doctors and young practitioners. Oh, I love it. And yeah, so, so you know, we were developing that for three days, mind melding what you know, what the course curriculum is going to be. So, but we, we, we have to one, embrace all this and not be a naysayer. Okay. About it. And it, we all need to explore all the options and really see what works because we've got, I mean, patients are in very serious situations now. Yeah, they and, are. And yeah, very serious situations. And, um, you know, why aren't we focusing on eliminating suffering in humanity? Yeah. Well, I love what you're doing and I love that you stand for all of this. And I, um, I feel like, especially after COVID that there was an awakening for some people and they're like, oh, I need to be empowered to take care of my own health. I need to figure out what I'm putting in and on my body. And I need to ask more questions to my doctor if they're just saying, oh, there's nothing we can do. So I feel like the pendulum's swinging, but we sure have a long ways to go still. But at least I think it's sort of swinging in the right direction. People are waking up to all of this. You're absolutely right. So thank you for all that you're doing to educate and help doctors and help people on social media. And I love what you talk about quite often on social media about cancer. And so that's why I brought you on today is because I haven't had a guest on here talk about cancer. I've had almost every topic but cancer. So I want to talk to you about cancer, but I want to start at the very beginning because the other day I asked a group of people what cancer was 
And they all couldn't describe it. They just would say like, oh, it's something that makes you really sick. You have to do chemo for it. It's something, but they couldn't actually answer what actual cancer was. So let's start at the basics for people. What is cancer? Right. That's a, that's good. I, were these medical people or non-medical? No, people? they weren't medical. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, actually cancer start, first of all, it's about a 10 year disease. Okay. Meaning from one cancer cell to tumor takes about 10 years. So here you have a cell and inside the cell is the nucleus and the cytoplasm. But one of the big things that in, that powers the cell is the mitochondria. Now we've had all these theories of of cancer, but the theory that's been around for quite some time, even though it's not addressed in conventional world, and every doctor learns about it in the in their medical school about the Krebs cycle of energy and how the mitochondria are responsible for making the energy of the cell. So what happens is the cell, each in, there's trillions of cells in your body, every cell has these ingredients in them and there's the mitochondria are the powerhouse engines of the cell. So it gets attacked every day. Every single day we're under attack. But we have all these defense systems to take care of you in our body naturally, okay? But if our defense systems get so attacked day in and day out, then the metabolism of the mitochondria changes. All right. So what is attacking the cell? Well, stress, just because the stress may be in your mind, it affects all the cells. It has an entire holistic physiological response, literally. Okay. So then second of all, if you look at what are you eating? Okay. Are you eating foods that nourish and strengthen your mitochondria? If you aren't, then your mitochondria are going to suffer. For example, let's take coenzyme Q10. So you can eat foods that have coenzyme Q10, but you may need a supplement with coenzyme Q10. All right. Then you look at heavy metals. There's heavy metals. All of us have heavy metals. The EPA says there is no safe level of heavy metals. All right. And so, uh, but we all, whether it's aluminum, mercury, cadmium, gadolinium, all the metals that there's some in all in the environment, they're in the air, they're water, they're in the food supply, they're in all the things that we put on our body. So, you know, um, you need to be picking products that try not to, you know, have heavy metals. Okay. But heavy metals, unfortunately, are, I haven't seen anyone that doesn't have heavy metals. So, so, and it's not just one heavy metal, it's the synergistic potential of all of them together. Then um, if you have elevated sugar levels, like if you just eat sugars, okay, then we know what sugar does to the immune system. So it, you know, paralyzes the, the white blood cells to not go attack things that are not good in your body. All right. So, and a lot of people eat sugar all day long. They don't realize it until they start reading labels and looking at things, right? Okay, then we have bugs, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, okay? And why do you even get an infection? Because your terrain is not healthy to fight it. Your immune system isn't healthy. You don't have the nutritional domain to equip the cells to work for you, all right? So then if you don't have enough voltage, voltage is the energy of the cell. So what takes away energy is stress heavy metals, toxic, other toxicity, insecticides, pesticides. We talk, there's a whole big thing about seed oils that are destroying the, the membranes of the cells. Um, then, you know, we have, um, you know, just a tremendous assault on the system. Then you look at your hormones, like if you don't have good thyroid, okay? So thyroid runs, it's the battery to your body. So if your cells don't have energy, then the cell can't take care of you. So for example, we check the voltage of our patients to make sure their cells have energy. And so then if your body is acidic from chronic stress and toxins and everything, then you have low oxygen. And when you have low oxygen, you have the cells can go into an abnormal cell cycle. So normally we go through the Krebs cycle of energy. They call it oxidative phosphorylation. That's a fancy name for your body making ATP. 
ATP is the currency of life. Now, when we have low oxygen from all the environment, then we get what we call anaerobic without oxygen uh, uh, in reactions, okay? So when we don't have oxygen, the cells go into an abnormal state. And so all it takes for cancer to develop is one abnormal cell in the perfect condition for cancer, which is all these all these attacks on the body, all right? Then it's low oxygen and then we make acidity. So then the, the environment continues unless we address the terrain of our body. And like when you go to the doctor today, you know, they don't talk about the terrain or the garden that the cells are living in. So no, then, the, yes. And then, so one abnormal cell starts duplicating in the abnormal correct conditions, and then it keeps going and going. All right. And so then in conventional medicine, we don't see cancer or diagnose cancer until there's a lump or bump. But I always use the analogy of an iceberg. So the lump or bump is just a symptom of a whole body dysfunction, okay? A whole, every cell is out of balance because they all are designed to work in harmony and synergy. So one cell talks to the other cell and they all work in cooperation and collaboration to take care of you each and every day. That's why it's very important that everyone learn how to steward their body because if you don't have your health, you have nothing, all right? Yep. You can't be a mother. You can't be a sister. You can't be, you can't be a family. You can't be a member of society if you don't have your health, right? So our health needs to be our number one value because health is, is the foundational, you know, existence of being a human, right? Yeah, you're right. And, and, you know, you can't read, you can't listen, you can't write, you can't do anything if you don't literally, if you don't have your health. Yeah. And so, but we don't esteem health in our society. Yes, there are people that do, I know, because there's a lot of great people doing great health podcasts and there are doctors teaching and creating health. But we've got we've got to create more of a contagious movement because we're if you look around you, it's it's we there's too many people still suffering. There are. So I have a question for you because listening to all of that of how cancer is formed a listener just might be like, oh my gosh, I'm doomed. Like too much sugar, too much stress, too many um, toxins. That's the world we live in. So what do you suggest to people that are like, well, forget it. I'm doomed to have cancer because of the world we live in. There's not much I can do. No, that's not true though. I tell people today's world, I always tell my patients today because you know I'm seeing 30 or a lot of 30 year olds with cancer. And I tell them it's, it's, it's not what you're doing necessarily because I have patients that really embrace healthy lifestyles and have cancer. Right. Okay. Not, not all of them, but some of them. Okay. And um, they, I tell people, first of all, you got to learn the rules of health. Like we know what they are. All right. So you need to partner with a doctor. First of all, can make sure you don't have cancer. Okay. That's, and there are ways of doing that. Okay. We have it available today. Uh, number one. Number two, you got to take inventory of yourself. Like, how am I living day to day? Is it serving me well? Okay. How am I stewarding my home that I get to live in every day? How am I taking care of itself? Because like, for example, I had a 33-year-old in here last week that I had to send to the ER because I thought he was going to have a pulmonary embolism and he did. But he was brand new patient, only been in the clinic a couple of days. He's 33 and he has stage four lung cancer to his, all the, to his brain even. Wow. Yes. And so he had vaped for eight years and ate like crap his whole life. So that is a recipe for disaster. Okay. And so we need to just say, how are we living each and every day? Okay. How are we sleeping? The water we drink, because you have to drink purified water today. There are inexpensive purifiers. You have to eat foods that nourish and strengthen and heal your body. You've got to move your body, all right? And um, you've got to take inventory of your head because 
it starts with what's going on in your brain every day because we're living 90% in our subconscious. And that subconscious recording started from in utero to now. And so what has happened to you? Your body keeps score of everything. And there's a great book called The Emotion Code. And we aren't taught from early on what, how do we, how do we, you know, we, we can try to measure the foods and eat the foods and read the foods and all that kind of stuff. But what do we do about this whole world in our head? And, you know, no one has a perfect life. There's no right. one that comes in here with this primrose path and everything. But, you know, if you read the book, Viktor Frankl, In Search for the Meaning of Life, it's like, how do we respond to this? Whatever curve on detour, how are we going to respond to it? Because we now know that in the first seven years of life, it predisposes, if you've had tr adverse childhood experiences, it predisposes people to illness later on. So we as a mother, I'm a mother, you know, like we have to make sure that our children that we are raising, that we're putting out the right energy. Like, for example, yesterday I had a patient, young girl, 34 years old. And so I always ask about stress. And then I always ask, like, how did you grow up? Well, her mother is a very, very anxious person. And then she tells me she's a very anxious person. Well, we become what we think about and who we're around most of the time. And so because it's I always tell parents today, I said, it's not what you say, it's what you model. If you don't model the behavior, a calm, peaceful existence, that's what your kids pick up on. And so so but this isn't the kind of information you're getting in everyday life, though, right? No, not at all. Not at all. And this is what we've got to teach all the humans, we've got to all work together to help one another be the best version of ourselves. And so, you know, I didn't learn in medical school about stress and emotional conflict. Okay. I didn't learn about it. Okay. And then about 28 years ago, I was going through something myself and then I got a life coach and then it was the most transformative thing. And then it made me go study everything about how we need to all handle life because we're all going to be faced with stress. This is part of life. Okay. And so, but it's life is how are we going to respond to it and how are we going to transform that unfavorable experience to something favorable? Like there was a book I read years ago called your disadvantages become your advantages. Ooh, and that's, I love that. Yes. And so we that's what we need to do is we need to figure out and i read i, I listened years and years ago to Thich Nhat han i don't know about if you know about Thich Nhat han mm -mm. Uh, he was a famous vietnamese buddhist he died in a couple of years ago but he lived until he was in his 90s and i remember years ago i listened to a cassette tape in my car so that was a long time ago and it says it turned how to turn your negative seeds into positive seeds. Oh, love it. And that was so good for me because, you know, we we none of us had a perfect childhood, right? Right. None of us. None of us. And so but we have to do self-reflection and say, where am I? Who am I? Where am I going each and every day? And what what did those things? How did they affect me? And so um, it's just not front and center, but I will tell you every medical conference that I've gone to for the past five or seven years, maybe even longer, they're all talking about how emotion is captured in a, you know, unfavorable emotion is, is, you know, creating illness. And it's not just the only thing I always tell right. people, you know, there isn't just one thing. It's the perfect storm of all these ingredients that are creating this abnormal environment to create a cancer cell. So we do have we do have magic in our body though. We have something called apoptosis. And apoptosis is programmed cancer cell death. So we have this mechanism of our body to go to kill cancer every day. But we got to make sure that switch is turned on with the proper environment whether it's how we think and how do we conduct our life every single day? And so 
Um, you know, and today, like, it's interesting. I started seeing an increase in young people, I would say about five years ago. And I was talking about it. I was like, wait, why are we, this is what's going on? Why are, what are we going to do about it? And, and because there's no screening for young people, right? There's no screening from people zero to 40. And I used to say, all, you know, for as long as I was practicing that, oh, you have a warranty until you're 40. Well, now I can't say that because all these young people have, not, and it's not just cancer, it's, you know, autoimmune diseases and all kinds of other things. And our public health system should be saying, oh my gosh, what is going on? Let's all work together to educate and empower and innovate and elevate humanity. But they're not, unfortunately. No, they're not. And so that's why people like you and all the other people out there who are trying to uh, educate people and inspire people. So I have a question about what you just said, though, about all of this. So people are really aware, I think, or becoming aware that like food can play a role in cancer and these toxins in our water and stress. But it's not very well known out there or accepted that emotions can contribute to cancer. And so you're saying like trapped emotions, past trauma, those things can truly play a part in cancer. Absolutely. So there was a famous doctor, Dr. Hammer. He wrote the five biological laws of medicine, and it's in my book. I talk about it in my book. So years ago, I was at a conference in Colorado, and these two doctors got up and talked about Dr. Hammer. So Hammer was a oncologist in Germany, and he was a conventional oncologist. And so he got cancer himself in his 50s. And so then he's like, okay, uh, he got diagnosed with testicular cancer. Well, testicular cancer is typically diagnosed in a young person. And so here he is, 50s. And then he starts asking all of his patients, so like, what happened to you? And what happened to you? And what happened? And he all, he asked all of them why they thought cancer developed and they all could relate it to a shocking event. Well, what happened to Dr. Hammer, his son was tragically killed. So then he started going a deep dive in the head of his patients. And he would do what he called a CT scan on the patient's head. And he would see what, they, what we call a flare. And that was related to part somewhere in your body. So anyway, he um, start, developed a way to talk patients out of their cancer. Well, he was reprimanded by the medical board in Germany and sent to jail. And then, of course, he presented all of his findings, got out of jail. He lived until he was in his 80s. And so that is taught here in the United States. And we're now seeing, if you look, there's another famous psychiatrist, Gabor Mate. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. And he talks about how trauma affects our body and how the more adverse things we have, it contributes to the disease process. And so um, lots of people now, you know, your body keeps score, emotion code. I mean, there's so many, the healing codes, there's so many things because stress and unfavorable emotional complex are stored as an electromagnetic frequency in our body. And that's what creates the unfavorable situation in our system. So I believe in what, you know, everything I've read and studied and so forth is that unresolved emotional conflict in whatever way is creating to the disease that we call heart disease or cancer or whatever it is. There's always an emotional component to illness. And so we need to always address that with the patients because sometimes, you know, the patient's living in their world and yeah. they have their recordings going on. They need an outside objective person to say, well, wait a second. So how do you think that affected your life? And then all they know is how to learn, live in their life. And they think, well, everybody has this. Well, no, I mean, yes, today I would say lots of people have stress because if they don't have family stress, they have external stress. But again, it's all how we all process it. Right. And I think the best book is that In Search for the Meaning of Life by 
uh, Frank, Dr. Frankel, who was a psychologist in the Holocaust, and when you know, which is probably one of the most unfavorable existences, right? Right. And so, how did you know what were the character traits of people who survived that? And so, um, so um, or survived cancer. If you look at, so there's a book called Radical Remission, and she was at our meeting last weekend talking. And she wrote the book and she studied people, how they survived and overcome a stage four cancer. Eight out of the 10 things were things the patient just did on their own. It wasn't what the doctor told them. It's what the things they did on their own, including emotional work. So, so it's too bad that this is not mainstream, you know? Everybody says, oh, well, where's the double blind study, current my study, you know, so forth and so on. Well, you know, are we going to do a study that we, this, these, this group of patient only does emotional work and we're going to see if it works or we're going to give them this one food and see if it works. Well, we can't do that. Right. Yeah. We, that's impossible because we know with illness, there's not one magic bullet to unravel disease. There's many magic bullets many. and and you've got to use it all. Because I always say, you know, that everyone is an N of one, all right? You're your own clinical trial every single day. Because how you respond, we, you talked about we're all exposed to toxins, except, but it's how your body responds to it all. And so, and knowing, like what we know today, oh my gosh, we, we can unravel so many things right now and the world doesn't know it. Yeah. Well, thank you for explaining all that about emotions and trauma and um, I was talking to a scientist this past week, actually, who does studies for can stage four cancer patients. And he was saying that 44% of them who get a placebo effect will actually heal from stage four cancer. And he said it's all, a lot of it is their thoughts and their brain and their energy. And, but he can't publish that as a, it doesn't count as a true science, but yet he knows that. that. And so it's fascinating. Yeah, look at spontaneous remissions. Yeah. They're published, okay? So he's absolutely right. Well, I remember years ago when I had a drug rep came to my office. I don't have any drug reps come to my office anymore. But I asked him what the placebo effect of this antidepressant was. It was 50%. Wow, yeah. So I'm like, so that means you can just get better on your own. Like Crazy. he's saying. With the right yes. tools. With the right tools. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do want to ask you, because you mentioned this earlier, that you're seeing younger and younger patients with cancer. So why is that? Why is this happening to people in their 20s, 30s? First of all, you have to understand that the DNA of a younger person is replicating much faster than a person who's 60, 70, 80 years old. Okay. So number two, there's a lot that's happened in the last 30 years. Okay. So if you look at um, the vaccine schedule changed. So I'm not sure what impact that has. Number two, much more increased exposure to toxicity, insecticides, pesticides, glyphosate, heavy, I mean, lots of more chemicals. Okay. Then the food supply, people, you know, eat a lot of boxed and packaged foods or fast food. All right. Then stress, I believe, is more now, okay, compared to when I was 30, stress, life was simple, not complicated, not so, you know, not so eruptive, all right? And then electromagnetic fields started, okay? So if you think about it, 30 years ago, there was really nothing, and it's exploded, especially, I would say, in the last 10 years. Okay. So, um, so I, this is a question I ponder every day and it's like, I always tell people, there's not just this one thing. It's like you make chocolate chip cookies. It's not the flour that mm -hmm. makes the recipe. It's all the, that's ingredients. a good analogy. Yeah. And so, you know, if you forget the flour, the cookies don't come out. So, so I, I, I think it's just a whole series of things that uh, all insults to our system, you know, our biological system, and that have created this storm. 
And so, uh, and then when we had COVID, that was stress for a lot of people. I mean, so many dynamics were involved because I, when I talked to patients about this aspect of their life, you know, there were just a lot of series of events that took place. And I, you know, like, it's interesting there, I saw this doctor from Harvard say, you know, these young people, it's, They've had, there's some increase in exposures uh, to them and their system is probably a little more fragile. Like I grew up, I didn't have EMFs and I didn't have the incredible chemicals that are in, in the environment today. It was freer. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and, and people were in community, you know, and you, you hung out outside and, and things that, you know, we're missing today and people are sitting on a computer every day and their whole life is that. Okay. I, my kids are, tw my youngest are 29 and like we, I didn't allow a cell phone until they were driving. And so, and, and then, you know, in the last 14 years, I mean, you know, EMF exposure has exploded and getting more profound. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, people say, oh, there's no science. Oh, no, I have all the science. I have all the papers. I, I, I always send it to my kids and everything because they're growing up in that environment. And so, because one of the biggest things that has changed is EMFs and an outrage, outrageous increase in chemicals. Like, look what's in, look at the ingredients in the things you buy from the dyes and the additives and the sweeteners and the seed the artificial oils. Artificial stuff. And yeah. yeah, it's like we're not eating from nature. Okay. Yeah. But I do say there are more companies that are trying to make really good products. So I'm happy about that. Like they're making natural products, right? They're trying to do, you know, good protein, good, you know, grass fed beef and good organic vegetables from your farmer's market. So I really appreciate all the efforts of these people trying to bring a product that is of good quality and, you know, is, is going to nourish and help our bodies, you know, but we need to get outside more. We're all inside on a computer, you know, just constantly, you know, electrified every day, you know, that just can't be, can't be good because people don't understand that we're a bio emotional, spiritual, we're a biochemical, we're a biophysical, and we're a bioenergetic being. So energy precedes action. So lots of things energetically. So to kind of, you know, explain this, your heart, what? It's an energetic rhythm, right? That's why how they do an EKG. Then your brain, they do EEGs. And then like, if you look at a nervous system study, it's all about checking the energy. A nerve conduction study is all about checking the energy. And then we have acupuncture points. Those are energy meridians, okay? So energetically, we're affected by every single thing in, in our environment, okay? And so we need to restore our energy every day by grounding and being connected with nature. And we're disconnected from one another, even though we have text and all that kind of stuff, but we need to be connected with humanity on a physically connected to humanity on a regular basis. And then because we have all these external abnormal electrical energy forces, we've got to do things to restore the energy of our body through, you know, the proper music, like doing solveggio frequencies, grounding, sitting under a tree, being in nature, walking on the beach, all these things. You know, there's actually a treatment called forest bathing, okay? You're, you're immersed in trees and, and grass and everything. I mean, that's kind of sad when really what's, that's how we grew up. I mean, right. at least how I grew up, you know, we slept outside on a regular basis, okay? Um, and so like we've gotten away and detached from nature and civilization is not helping us anymore now, okay? Like all this fast, you know, high tech stuff, it's not making people better. And this yeah. is what, you know, we should be all like, I always think about God, there's so many smart people, but why aren't we really making people aware of this? I mean, why isn't that the force? 
yeah. that needs to be out there. I love everything you said about energy because that is not talked about very often with cancer in the, you know, just the normal people. And sometimes when I talk about energy, people will be like, yeah, that's, you know, crazy stuff. That's alternative stuff. And it's like you said, the EKG is energy. You know what I mean? These different tests are energy. So thank you for explaining that. Um, I do have a question about something you said a little while back ago. You were saying that we can turn on the switch in our body to um, like send the defenses against cancer every day, all day long, right? We can help defend the cancer in our body. And so I'm assuming that is by eating foods that are rich in antioxidants. Is that what you're referring to? You're directing your cells every day, right? Every day. Okay. So one of the affirmations I say every day is thank you, God, for invincible healing, invincible uh, harmony, invincible homeostasis in my body every single day. Thank you, God, that my body is taking care of me. So first of all, I think the first thing is setting your mind every day. I call it a PMA, a positive mental attitude, and try to be there. And what we give all of our patients healing affirmations so they learn how to program themselves because otherwise the day programs you. And you need to start your day with how great it's going to be and how peaceful you're going to be. And so you're setting the tone right there, right? Because we have the nervous system. We have the autonomic nervous system. We have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The parasympathetic is healing. The sympathetic stressed is not healing. So that we know that if your body's stressed, what happens to your heart rate, your blood pressure, your circulation, right? So so it has to start with that number one, okay? So your cells, your, your, your mind and your brain and your thoughts are directing your cells. Like I tell every patient, your cells are listening to you every day. So make sure you program it the right way. And that's not just one time a day. We have to re-engage on a regular basis in our 24-hour day, right? So you should right. at least start the day that way. And then if you're driving, program. If you're doing something that doesn't require to pay attention, be thinking about that before you go to bed, do deep breathing and do your affirmations, whatever it work, however it works for you. And then obviously, you know, hydration, you've got to drink water, you know, because that's how your body cleanses itself and nourishes, you know, the organs like your kidneys need, like I tell people, you, you die within 72 hours of not drinking water. And then today, the water is very contaminated. Like in the state of California, the water is now just recycled sewage water now oh, as gross. of recently. So that means you have to invest in, in water because water. like your cells bathe in water, okay, every day, okay? They bathe in salt water. So you've got to have the right minerals and electrolytes and everything for the cells to talk to one another, first of all, to take care of themselves and then to talk to one another. Then, like you said, you have to eat foods that have good antioxidants. So that's fruits and vegetables. So you've got to eat foods that have high powers of antioxidants. What's an antioxidant? It's a force. First of all, we make them ourselves. Like we make glutathione. We make superoxide dismutase. But if we want to have vitamin A and vitamin C and vitamin E and selenium, which are antioxidants, we're going to have to eat them, right? So we have to nourish them. And today you can't get everything from your food because so then you've got to make sure you kind of go overboard with something you know, like a good food-based vitamin as opposed to a synthetic vitamin. You may have to take extra antioxidants like Vitamin C, Linus Pauling, who invented the chemical bond, he said, you know, vitamin C is the ultimate antioxidant. It neutralizes toxins, it neutralizes heavy metals, it helps you get rid of bugs, and it and it enhances your immune system. So make sure you have plenty of C, whether it's natural, it could be lemons and limes, it could be a natural version of vitamin C. Um, but we have that equipment in our body, but we also have to have all the vitamins and minerals for us to make the proper antioxidants and the cells to take care of you. So in today's world, we need probably more, I would say, you know, because of what we're all being attacked with. Okay. And then um, 
like exercise. Exercise helps your voltage be better. So the cells can take care of you better. And like, for example, one of the best things for turning apoptosis on is curcumin. Mm. So curcumin, the spice turmeric, so eating it or taking it in an absorbable form. Um, so, um, So the beauty is you've got to take care of the chemistry and harmony of your system each and every day. I love that. Well, thank you for explaining all of that. I do have a question that I know listeners are wanting me to ask. They're going to say, okay, we understand, you know, these toxins around us, our thoughts, our energy, but are there tests or screenings or things that we can do to see if we have cancer now? Right. So the best test, first of all, um, because it might be difficult to go through everything, but in my book, Cancer Revolution, I talk about all the testing that can be done. So most important things on a typical blood test is C-reactive protein. It's a marker of inflammation, a hemoglobin A1C, which is a reflection of your sugar over 90 days, and your DHEA sulfate levels, okay? DHEA is the main hormone made by your adrenal glands. It's the hormone of stress, immune, and longevity. And so, uh, and vitamin D, okay? So those things you can check on any lab. It's easy to do. The other test I do is I do a blood test called the cancer profile that looks for quantitative HCG. HCG is the hormone of pregnancy, but it's hormone malignancy. So that test will tell me if cancer's kind of, you know, it's forecasting of cancer may be brewing in your body. The other blood test I do is called the PHI, phosphohexoisomerase. It tells me if your body has anaerobic metabolism without oxygen. You know how they create cancer cells in the laboratory is they decrease the oxygen and the, can the cancers can be formed. So you want to make sure your body has adequate oxygenation so it's not in an anaerobic state. So um, so that though that test is pretty, you know, it's not expensive and it can be done. The other test, if you want to spend like maybe five or $600, um, there's a test uh, done by a lab called RGCC called Oncotrace. It's a liquid biopsy. So a liquid biopsy is they take your blood and it will tell if you have circulating tumor cells. So circulating tumor cells form when something is about one to two millimeters. Remember we said cancer starts with one cell. When that clump of cells turns into one to two millimeters, it releases what we call circulating tumor cells. Those are the cells responsible for the cancer traveling to a new home nest or destination. So metastasizing. So it will, that test is a good test. But again, I just don't rely on one test because I want to make sure. The other test that I learned years ago was called the bioimmune survey. You have acupuncture points like we talked about before, the acupuncture meridians or the energy meridian. So every point on your body is like, an, it's like a wire or a string of pearls to an organ or gland. So when the practitioner takes and looks at the point, they will see the energy coming out. This was designed by Dr. Reinhold Voll. And Dr. Voll was a medical doctor who determined the acupuncture points and what organ they were related to. So fast forward, it's been computerized. And so you look, the practitioner looks to see if they're in the, in the right energy voltage, okay? And then if it's not, what is blocking it, that? Is that because you have toxicity, which I will tell you that most people, we need to all do some kind of cleansing on a regular basis that you can do at home, okay? Number two, candida. Fungus and cancer is a very, very strong con connection. Even the, conven the conventional journals say that 60% of cancer patients have yeast and fungus. Now, why do we have so much yeast and fungus? Because we take birth control pills, we take antibiotics, we eat sugary foods, we, we have this we have we normally have bugs in our body. We have this microbiome that exists in every organ and facet of our body. And once it gets out of balance, you can create yeast. And what I always ask every patient, how many times you think you've taken antibiotics? Well, you can create yeast just taking antibiotics one course. 
So doctors, what they should do is you've got to counterbalance, right? You have to counterbalance. If you give a patient antibiotic, then you need to say, okay, you need to go on a strict eating program of no sugar, et cetera, and take probiotics. And you may need to take something for yeast, natural for yeast, okay? So, but yeast is a really, really big problem today because of and the more toxins, the more sugar, the more antibiotics, the more medicines, it creates the yeast environment. So this test tells me, like I said, the balance of the energy meridians and the imbalance. But more importantly, I do something called the cancer cascade. The cancer cascade is a timeline from year one to 10. And there's a characteristic of cancer cells. Okay, what is the characteristic? We've talked about acidity toxicity, immune system, is your immune system good? So like I use a lot of vitamin C and noni and uh, ecomer shark oils to help your immune system. And then uh, blood supply, like we can tell if you need something that cancer cells stay alive because they have a blood supply, right? Does the cells have the desire for blood supply? Well, we test energetically because there's things in medicine today called Advastin to cut up blood supply, but there's lots of things in nature like V-stat and it's a special herb and angiostop. These all shut off blood supply. And then the other big thing again is acidity. All right. Acidity, you know, we have, it's not just your saliva, blood and urine, it's your tissue acidity. So if you're acidic, you're going to have an environment for cancer and all diseases. So, and there's no real good way to test for acidity. Okay, yes, you can test like your saliva, urine, and blood, but it's how do you test the tissue acidity? So, and acidity affects voltage. If your body's acidic, then you don't have good energy, all right? Because the pH scale is one to 14. Our ideal pH is 7.43. So if we go down below, we're, we're robbing energy and voltage out of our body. So that means the cell can't take care of you. So a lot of people say just taking a little baking soda every day will help your body not be acidic. So, and I use not other things other than acidity. So in this cancer cascade, I can look and see what systems that are in balance. In the Chinese medical system, in, in oriental medicine, they have eight systems. So 101 is lungs, 201 is gastrointestinal, 301 is genitourinary, 401 is ductless glands, that's brass, prostate, ovary, and thyroid. And then 501 is blood, 601 is lymph, 701 is muscle, skin, and bone, and 801 is central nervous system. So we have specialty herbs that we use for those systems. So if you test that there's an, an imbalance in that system, then we go, oh, hmm, something's going on. So there are many people that come to see me for prevention. So I kind of do, you know, a little bit of all that. And, and it's so important that we look at the tapestry of what's going on. And, you know, doing most doctors, for example, don't check C-reactive protein, which is the nonspecific marker for inflammation. Just that alone can give you great information. You know, you should have a CRP of 0.5. So good to know. Okay, but I want to ask you about all these tests. I'm so glad that there's a lot of screening and things that you can do, but I know people that are listening are going to say to your first few things you said to get tested, they're going to say, wait, my vitamin D is always low. How is that a concern with cancer? Or they're going to say, wait, how does my blood glucose levels um, tested? How does that, you know, is that one thing going to tell me I have cancer? And I'm assuming no, no it's, right? It's yeah, right. It's the evaluation of all of these things, you know, like you have to look at everything. Okay. Meaning everything tells you, for example, if your inflammation level is high, what's causing it? And we got to take care of it. If your blood sugar is high, doesn't mean you have cancer. It just means your cells are weaker and can't take care of you that well. Right. So if your vitamin D is low, that means your body, it influences 3000 genes, either upregulating or downregulating. So these are just the environment. Let's make sure your environment is good and healthy, that you're not in an abnormal terrain or garden. Okay. 
Good to know. I have one last question for you as we wrap up here, but this is a big question. And so I'm like, man, I need a whole nother podcast episode with you, but maybe you can give a shortened version. But I know that you talk about that there are more treatments out there than just chemo. And so what are some of these maybe other treatments that people could look for or research on their own, or where could they find more info about these new therapies that are, you know, becoming more and more popular in the market today? Well, there are, first of all, uh, if you have a diagnosis of cancer, you may need surgery, chemo, and radiation. But because those are injurious immunosuppressive treatments, you must be on a longevity protocol and a cancer protocol together. Why? Because they're injurious, that means we have to constantly be making sure that the body is strong and every cell is strong. So your collateral support is going to be critical. So a lot of people go, oh, that doesn't mean anything. Well, no, it means a lot because as I said, a biopsy, surgery, chemo, and radiation are all injurious immunosuppressive. So you've got to partner with a doctor who's going to take care of you completely, all right? And take care of collaterally balance all of those, okay? Number two, the other treatments that I've used, okay, are one, IVs, IV vitamin C, IV artisanate, IV mistletoe, okay, subcutaneous mistletoe. There's a lot of different IVs that I use that are anti-cancer, okay? There's publications written on this, all right. Then I may use something called the endolaser, which is intravenous with a photosynthesizing agent. Photosynthesizing because your cells take up color. So these, these photosynthesizers bring out the bad cell and then the laser is there to destroy it. Then I use something called voltage. I use um, uh, a device called sonoelectric pulse. So we're looking at any abnormal areas of the body that have abnormal polarity. When cells have abnormal polarity, we know something is wrong. We use hyperbaric oxygen, so different types of oxygen treatments, all right? Then um, we always do lymphatic drainage on our patients. Like I said earlier, we always look at the voltage because if your body doesn't have energy, period, bottom line, you can't take care of yourself with anything, okay? Um, and then um, I will use repurposed drugs. There's drugs that starve cancer. So I will figure out the best drugs for the patient to starve cancer. Then I'll make sure they have the best nutritional regime to fight cancer, but also for nutrient repletion that they need. So we always check their vitamins, minerals, heavy metals. So we make sure that every cell has the necessary ingredients to nutritionally take care of themselves. So it's a lot, you know. That is a lot, but I love that there's lots of different options out there and that you can do the, if we're going to call them conventional and maybe alternative, you can use both together. And like you said, you should use both together. I love that, that you should. Okay. I said I had one last question, but I actually have one more, (laughs) one last one. I actually have a lot of followers who are dealing with cancer or who have family members that are dealing with cancer. It can be such a huge trial in people's lives, which I know I have some listening to this episode. What advice would you give them? What would you, what would be the number one thing you would tell them? Well, to educate themselves with so much information out there. You know what the conventional journey is because the oncologist is going to tell you and you can validate that on PubMed, but you need to understand how this all came about. So you need to read. First of all, I have cancer conversation every two weeks. We talk about a dynamic discussion or someone's talking about something. Um, Partner with a whole group of people who can help you figure this out, okay? You can't do this alone. And you've got to create your family and make sure that your family's on the same page as you um, in getting well. But there are conventional treatments that you may need, but you better know all the other things too that can help you. I mean, not only my book, Cancer Revolution, there's, so you know, How to Starve Cancer, Radical Remission, all these books. Uh, The Emperor of All Maladies is a great book or in movie. So all of these things can, you just need to devour the information. And if you're too weak to do it, have someone in your life that can help you do it. 
and have people that just love and adore you and are hundred percent for your healing. Oh, I love that. I really love that. Um, thank you so much for being here on the show today. I seriously have 25 more questions I could easily ask you, but we will wrap up due to time. Thank you so much for being here. Will you tell my listeners where they can find you, your book, um, more education from you? Right. So if you just go to Keneally, M-D, C-O-N-N-E-A-L-Y-M-D, that's my handle on Instagram. You can go to our website, Keneally, M-D, Cancer Center for Healing or Center for New Medicine. Uh, so it's relatively easy in the book, Cancer Revolution. In fact, I'm writing Cancer Revolution Part 2 um, oh, wow. that will hopefully be available soon. So uh, anyway, so it's all about all of us working together to enhance the lives of all human beings on the planet. Well, I love everything that you teach. I'm excited for your second book, but I love your daily stuff that you're teaching on uh, social media, which is amazing to me because I know you're so busy as a doctor. So I love that you even get info up for everybody else to learn about all these things for free. So thank you so much. And you're I, welcome. I always end my podcast by asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? Uh, well, there's not just one ingredient, as you know, but as I said, get peace of mind and a positive mental attitude every day have a purpose and a passion, and have a circle of friends and family around you, elevating you, elevating you. I love that. And I love what you've talked about on the show today about that. Something I'm going to now work on after listening to this podcast. I'm like, oh, I can do better at that. So thank you for everything that you taught. Listeners, go give her a follow. You will not be disappointed at all. You will learn so much from her. And again, thank you for all that you're doing out there in the world to help people. Thank you.